A few months ago, we got a new security system for our house that included two mounted cameras. One was on the doorbell, and another was a motion sensor camera that looked out over the backyard. We didn't live in a bad area or anything, but people stealing packages off of porches wasn't unheard of, and we ordered a lot of stuff online. We also had two dogs, and when the camera detected motion, we got a notification. Soon our dogs figured out they could activate the backyard sensor to let us know that they wanted back inside. We had a huge yard in a rural area, so we let them out to run around the yard whenever they wanted. This new system worked out well, at least until something started tripping our camera at all hours of the night. The little dinging notification would wake me or my husband up a few times a week, and it drove us crazy. At first, we just turned our phones off at night, once the dogs were inside. But we were definitely still curious about what was out there. We tried watching the video, but the quality wasn't great in the dark, and we never saw anything clearly. Sometimes we thought we saw a blur at the edge of the yard, but it could have been a shadow or anything, really. So we gave up and started to ignore the notifications. A month later, one of our dogs came home injured. He had some bloody scratches and bite mark punctures. He was whimpering like crazy, and we freaked out. We rushed him to the vet to get him all patched up. Luckily, he was going to be okay, but the vet gave him a bunch of shots, just in case. When we asked what could have done that, the vet was stumped. He said the bite marks were vaguely canine, but too big to be a domestic dog. They didn't quite match anything he was familiar with. For a while after that, we were really careful about keeping the dogs close to the house. We watched them at all times when they were in the yard, and we didn't let them stay out long. We also noticed that our dog that had been attacked had no interest in getting too far from the house. We talked about different ideas, like fencing in a smaller area, but the dogs were energetic and loved being able to run. We decided to wait and see if anything else happened. It had been months without an incident, so we started cautiously letting them stay out longer and not watching them every second. We were hoping it had been a freak occurrence. And for a while it seemed fine. But then one evening, a little before dusk, we heard them barking like crazy. We nervously ran outside and called to them. At first they didn't come to us and they stayed at the edge of our property, barking and growling at something we couldn't see. We keep calling them. It took a while, but eventually, they did come. That night, I left my phone volume up. I don't know why, but I just wanted to know if something was out there after all. Especially if it was whatever had previously attacked our dog. I couldn't sleep and kept alternating watching out the window and keeping an eye on the security system app. By one in the morning, nothing had come past, so I relaxed and fell asleep. Luckily, when the ding sounded on my phone, I was only half asleep. I shot up and grabbed my phone. I looked at the video and saw that dark blur again. Something was out there. I was sure of it now. I woke my husband, and he grabbed a baseball bat because that was all we had. And we both slowly went downstairs without turning on any lights. We looked out the back door window and watched for the black blur. We didn't turn on the light because we didn't want to scare anything away or alert it to us being there before we got a good look. It took about 10 minutes before we saw it move, but there it was, big and dark, walking way down at the far edge of the property. And when I say walking, I mean walking upright, like a person, not on all fours. It was so weird. We had been expecting an animal, but wondered if it was a person after all. Maybe someone lurking around looking for stuff to steal. I'd been sure that the thing that had attacked our dog was the same thing in the backyard, but now I was confused. Did we have a dangerous wild animal on the loose and a creepy guy? What were the odds of having both? We kept watching, hoping to get a better look so we could tell the police something useful if we needed to. Eventually it came closer to the house, just close enough for us to see it in the moonlight. We saw fur fur everywhere. The person or thing was tall, really tall, but covered in fur. It didn't make any sense. It was coming closer to the house now. If it came any closer, I planned to turn on the back floodlight and see it. It took a few minutes, but it did come close enough. 
I reached over and flipped the light switch, flooding the backyard with light. The thing screeched and turned and ran, but not before we saw it clearly. We saw the tall, dark, furry body and also the face. The horrible face. It was dog-like, with a canine-looking snout and long, sharp teeth. The worst part was the eyes, though. Reddish-orange and glowing as they glared at us before running off. The thing had looked like a demonic dog person. We called the police and animal control, but once we explained how we had seen this strange creature walking around with glowing eyes, they thought we were crazy. We even sort of thought we were too. How could this thing really exist? We got a half-hearted promise from the police that they would search the woods and set some traps, but we could tell that it probably would never happen. And wouldn't you know, they never did come back. This was told to me by my grandfather. It's about something he experienced way back in the 1940s, right after World War II ended. He had just got out of the service and was working for his dad on a small cattle farm in rural Iowa. One morning, his dad pulled him out of bed early because the cattle had gotten out a hole in the fence and wandered off into the woods behind his house. It was nearing winter. There wasn't any snow on the ground just yet, but temperatures were already beginning to dip under freezing, and there was a thin layer of frost on the ground, which made it pretty easy to track where the cattle had run off to. When I say cattle, of course, I'm not talking about the huge 200 or 300 head herds that you would expect from a cattle ranch today. Back then, my great-grandfather had about 10 cows and a bull was all, so the whole herd had gone missing pretty easily and quickly once they found the breach in the barbed wire. The cows aren't the stars of this story, though. Those 10 were found right off and put back in pretty easily. It was the bull, a big brown brindled monster of an animal that my grandpa and his dad called Jed that would prove to be the problem. Jed was a longhorn bull my great-grandfather had hauled home from Texas when he first bought the farm. He'd got him cheap on account of him having lost his eye to a coyote attack, but aside from being blind on one side, he was a perfectly good bull and capable of getting the job done. Great-grandpa was the first longhorn owner in the county he lived in in Iowa and had hopes of crossbreeding them with Angus to create a better beef herd. The problem with Jed, even before this fateful day, was that he was aggressive and impossible to get corralled anywhere if he didn't want to be. This meant Grandpa and his dad were in for a real hell of a morning trying to get him back into the pasture once he was free out in the woods. Long story short, they wound up chasing Jed back straight through those woods and right into the quartz quarries on the other side. There was a big pit at the quarries that had filled up over time with water. The local kids loved to go swimming there, but it was so deep that local folklore always told that there was no bottom to it. You can probably guess where that dumb bull wound up running into. According to Grandpa, they did everything they could to get him out, but he fought them off while swimming the best he could until exhaustion overtook him. When he died, he sunk to the bottom and everyone waited for his body to float back up, but it never did. Not long after that, they put a fence around the pit to keep folks out of it, and the fence stood for 60 years or so before it first started rotting away. The quarries had long since been abandoned and were no longer a work site. It just became a local oddity to stumble upon in the woods every now and then, someone would share the story of the longhorn bull that sunk to the bottom and never came back up. I want to say it was 2005 or 6 that it finally did though, just not in the way anyone expected. It was pretty dry that summer, and the water in the pit had gone down quite a bit. It was fall, and that means it was hunting season, and a couple hunters had wandered out into those woods hunting a deer when they heard all kinds of grunting and commotion going on at the old quarries. When they walked up to it, they thought someone must be playing a practical joke because, inside that fence, there stood a huge, one-eyed brown brindle bull, just like the old town folk story had told. My dad was the sheriff by then, and when they got the call of a bull stuck in the old quarry fence, he swung by and got Grandpa to go with him, just for the spectacle of it all. They too thought it was a prank until they got there. 
I came along for the ride, too, being a small town. I was able to occasionally get away with tagging along with Dad while he worked, and I wanted to see the bull for myself. When we got there, Grandpa looked like he was seeing a ghost. He kept pointing out markings on the bull's body and saying over and over to us, It's the same dang bull. I swear to God above, it's the same dang bull. When the bull saw my grandpa, it calmed down and pushed its nose through a gap in the rotten fence planks. Grandpa gave him a pet and said, It's you, isn't it, Jed? As hard as it was to believe, there was no denying that Grandpa firmly believed the bull to be the same one that fell back in the 1940s, and the bull seemed to recognize Grandpa too. All at once, though, the bull backed up and balked like he had become spooked by something. Then he stepped backward and fell back down into the pit. Again, everyone kept an eye on it, but the bull never did come back up. The next year, they brought in cement trucks to try to fill the pit back up. After a week of pouring and still no bottom in sight, they gave up on the effort. Today, there's a big concrete slab over the top and a newer, more secure fence built around it. I can't really explain what happened there that day. All I know is that that bull had somehow fallen in that pit and come back a half century later. I still wonder if it was just a small town folklore prank that's been going on for decades. I know no one will ever believe the story I'm about to tell. Ever since I was a little kid, I've never liked bugs. Growing up in PA, the cicadas that came out every couple of years made me basically bedridden. If I went outside and one of those things landed on me, I was screaming bloody murder. I'm sure I'm not the only one that doesn't like bugs. Anyway, my older sister by about two years goes to college down in West Virginia. I'm finally at that age now where she respected me enough to let me come down and visit with her and her friends. Of course, I loved that because a few of them are really cute and tend to pay a lot of attention to me. It used to be a really good time, honestly, but now I can't step a foot across the state border without going into a full-on panic attack. So I'm down there for the weekend about three months ago, just hanging with her and her friends. If you're not from a rural area, you might not know what I mean. But we were all at this giant field party, just everyone hanging out by the edge of the woods. And it isn't really like me, but on this day, I'm talkative as hell. I walked all around, met about a hundred people I'll never meet again, and was having a great time. But that all came to an end very quickly, when my sister and her roommates invited me to walk with them further down the field. Yeah, remember how cute they are. So we're all standing there and talking when all of a sudden I begin to feel the most uncomfortable, random anxiety. I don't know what it was exactly, but I could just tell something was wrong. For starters, it was dark as hell out, and the only way we could really see around was with our phones. Not to mention, there was all of this buzzing sounds happening around us. Annoying as hell, because as I said, not a bug fan. Really not a bug fan. So we decided to continue walking, and the second we start to walk away, we all hear this gigantic, super loud buzzing sound. It was practically like we heard a lawnmower starting up nearby. On the edges of the field were just these thick forests, really tall trees and everything. That's where the sound was coming from, so we all kind of whipped our heads around. Me, I'm over there having a dang heart attack because the first thing I thought of when I heard the buzzing was that there was some kind of swarm coming or maybe we disrupted a hive, but it wasn't that. Nope, not that at all. Crazy thing is that our fight or flight kind of turned into more of a stand and watch. We look around at the edge of the forest and we don't really catch a good look at anything until suddenly our friend Jen shrieks bloody murder. We don't even get a chance to ask her what she saw because it was like she saw a ghost. She turned around and hauled herself as quick as she could back to the party. What gets me, really, is that nowadays when I bring it up to her or my sister, they insist that they didn't see anything. That is a total lie, plain and simple. But the thing is that I can't even blame them for trying to convince themselves otherwise. What we saw, that was the freakiest thing I've ever laid my eyes on, 
So she runs off and her boyfriend chases behind her and the rest of us sort of glance around at each other because we're all way too nervous to check out the spot Jen was eyeing up before she bolted. Eventually, though, I turned my head to look. And let me tell you, I will never be able to forget the image. The first thing that I noticed was the eyes, because I know for sure that I've never seen an animal, person, or creature with eyes like those. They were practically the size of basketballs, those eyes. Gigantic, glowing, and bright red. Fire truck red, a really pure red that almost looked like it could be some kind of light. They looked absolutely unreal, and even worse, they looked disgustingly bug-like. But as I said, the eyes were just the first thing I noticed. The next characteristic, which is obviously what made it stand out so much, was the fact that this thing, this entity, whatever, was only a few inches taller than I was and had wings that unfolded as we were watching it. It was like it saw us. Now it's obvious why Jen screamed and ran. We just hear this buzzing, this insect-like clicking coming so loudly from the creature in front of us. We see it making the noises, though it's hardly close enough for us to make out any distinct facial features. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't know if the damn thing even had a face. We were all frozen in fear. We just stood in a staring match with this thing, and then, like a miracle, it flew away. It flapped its crazy, human-sized wings and flew deep into the forest. It was gone as fast as it came, and I still have no clue what the heck it was. I mean, I do have a tendency to overreact, but this was completely different. We all saw it, and all felt the same way. I couldn't have made this up. Made up the fear we all felt about it. Anyway, now it's one of those things that we don't bring up anymore. But I will tell you this. That experience has caused me to be extra alert and cautions. And now I always remember to double-check the locks at night. I'm definitely not taking any chances. So, I don't know how this will all play out. But one thing is for sure, I still do not like bugs. I grew up in West Virginia and I've heard all of the stories about the creatures in the woods. My grandfather was superstitious and always told me that the land we lived on didn't belong to us. I kind of brushed all of the superstitious stuff aside because I never saw or experienced anything personally. That is until about a week ago when something bizarre happened. I live with my husband, but he had picked up an extra shift at work and I wasn't expecting him to be home until 2 in the morning so I was home alone. I often have trouble sleeping when he's not home, so I was up watching some late night cartoons with my cat, Fluffernutter. It was about 11 at night and I heard my husband Jim call my name. I was surprised he was home so early, usually he will send a text when he is on his way. But I yelled to him that I was in bed watching TV and then just waited, expecting him to walk through the bedroom door. A minute passed, but he hadn't come in. I called for him again and waited for a response. For a moment I thought I might have imagined hearing him call my name, but at the same time a part of me was on alert. I muted the TV and listened carefully for any sounds from downstairs. After a moment, I heard him call my name again. Yep. It was the exact same voice I'd heard every day for the past three years. I was instantly at ease. He called my name again. There was no inflection in the voice, nothing to indicate what he was calling me for. It sounded a bit off, but I just figured he was tired or something. What is it? I finally yelled. I was still sitting in bed with the remote in my hand. He called my name again, but this time it sounded further away. I finally stood up from the bed and walked to the door. I flipped the hall light on and just so you know, I watch way too many horror movies where they all walk around in the dark, so I wasn't about to do that. I looked down the stairs expecting to see Jim standing there, but the hall was completely empty. So I slowly started walking down the stairs. I mean, I was on edge already and now it was getting worse. Something about this was totally creeping me out. I called out for Jim again, but didn't get a response. I walked through the house and flipped on every light looking for him. Eventually, I made it to the kitchen. I turned on the light and instantly noticed that the kitchen door to the back of the house was cracked open. 
Every part of my body screamed at me to turn around and go back upstairs, and I wish I'd have listened. But I moved forward. I knew I heard Jim and I wasn't going back until I saw him in case something was wrong. I opened the kitchen door the rest of the way and stood there in the doorway. We lived right at the edge of the woods. My grandfather owned the house before he passed it down to me, and he had built a large barn where he used to raise goats. I stared at the barn for a moment, wondering why the hell the light was on. We don't use the barn at all. It's old and rickety, and the wood is waterlogged and rotten. It isn't even safe to use for storage. I yelled for Jim again, but didn't get a response. All I could think about was why he would be in the barn this late at night, let alone home yet from work. I slipped on a pair of boots sitting by the door and started walking towards the barn. The closer I got to it, I could hear shuffling inside like someone was walking across the old crunchy hay. I heard my name being called again, but this time it didn't come from the barn. The voice came from the woods beside me. I stopped mid-stride with my eyes locked on the open barn door. I was about halfway between the barn and my house and completely petrified. And then without any noise leading up to it, the light in the barn shut off. And now in the darkness I could see a pair of glowing yellow eyes. I immediately turned and booked it back to house, slamming the kitchen door shut and locking it. I grabbed one of the kitchen knives and hurried up the stairs to grab my phone. I was about to call the police when I saw a message from Jim. He had texted me saying he wouldn't be home until 7 in the morning because he was able to pick up overtime hours and told me not to wait up for him. It felt like my heart stopped beating when I read that. I knew for sure now that whoever or whatever had called my name wasn't Jim. I dialed 911 and explained to them that someone had just been in my house calling my name and that I'd seen someone in my barn and asked him to send a patrol car over right away. One of the downsides of living in a small town in the country is how far you are from everything, how isolating it can be. It took 30 minutes for the police to arrive and it felt like hours. I was crouching on the floor in the corner beside my bed with the knife in my hand. The entire time I was waiting for the police, I kept hearing Jim's voice call my name. It felt like it grew more desperate every time it called for me, which was horrifying. As soon as I saw the lights from the cop car, I ran outside to safety. He walked the perimeter of my property and said he didn't see any signs of anyone. And even more terrifying, the barn didn't look like anyone had stepped foot in it in ages. He told me to get some sleep and I could tell he thought it was all my imagination. Well, I didn't sleep at all. And to be honest, I drove to where my husband works and just sat in my car in the parking lot until he was off. I don't know who or what I'd seen and heard in our house that night, but I know it had to be something supernatural. Do you ever feel like people just don't pay attention to what's going on around them? I do. I mean, how many people are there in Chicago and it seems like I'm the only one who notices this strange, weird building? Okay, let me start from the beginning. I work at a bar in downtown Chicago. I get to work around 5 on the L train and get done about 1 in the morning. Then I take the train home. The bar is near this department store in an old building. I don't know when it was built. Seems like it was built around the 1920s. I go there sometimes if I need something, a new shirt or whatever, just because it's close to work. In the basement, they had a clearance area or outlet or whatever. I liked to go there because everything was cheaper, you know. But one day I needed new socks, so I went there, and the basement part was closed. The escalator was blocked off and you couldn't even see down there anymore. I didn't think much of it at the time, except I wondered what they were going to put down there. I bought a couple pairs of regular priced socks and asked the clerk. She said she didn't know, but she acted kind of weird about it. I went on to work and didn't think about it anymore. A week or so later, though, I was on my way to the L train to go home when I saw people moving some huge boxes into the bottom floor of the store. That wouldn't have been that weird except that it was one in the morning, remember. They were using one of those hydraulic movers to bring them inside. 
I would have thought it was just store merchandise, but who moves in store merchandise in the middle of the night? Besides, they weren't bringing it in by the loading dock and back. I don't know why. I felt like they were in a hurry. They were moving fast. I counted ten of those big boxes, like the size of a small car except turned on its side. I tried to stay far enough away so they wouldn't see me, and I did feel like they were looking around to see if anyone was watching. Again, not normal if they were just moving merchandise. I knew there was a freight elevator that they could be using to bring those boxes down to the basement, and I had a feeling that was what they were doing. Now here's where it starts to get really weird. I heard a scream come out of the last box as they moved it in. I know what you're thinking, like, how did I know it was coming from the box? I just knew. It was like something told me. Besides, it didn't sound like anything I'd ever heard before, not like a person or a dog. It sounded otherworldly. That's the only way I can explain it. After that, I made a point to walk by the building on my way to the L train. In the afternoon when I came to work, I never noticed anything odd at all. But every night I seemed to see or hear something different. The next day after the boxes, I heard loud grinding noises coming from that building, like a huge machine with gears. Or maybe like a circular saw, but huge and screeching, like it was cutting metal. How did no one else notice this? I'm thinking that because it's around one in the morning. The few people around were either drunk or something, I guess. Or maybe they just didn't want to hear it. I didn't hear that noise the night after. It was quiet, and I thought maybe it was just people bringing merchandise into the store after all. So a few days passed, and then every time I went by, I heard nothing. I still wondered what happened to those boxes, though. What was in them? Sometimes in the afternoon, I'd walk by the back and see people unloading trucks like normal. The stuff came in smaller boxes, and they unloaded it on the loading dock. It was a totally different operation than what I'd seen that one night. Every once in a while, I'd ask someone if they knew what was in the basement of the store now. No one ever knew. One day, an employee from the store came in wearing the uniform. She sat at the bar and ordered a double rum and coke. I was nervous as I made it. I had to ask her. I had to know. As I gave her the drink, I thought she looked tired, stressed maybe. Hey, I said casually. I used to shop in the basement of your store. What's down there now? She jumped a little like I'd startled her. What do you mean? She said. I mean, what's down there now? In the basement of the store? I asked. Nothing, she said. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't believe her, not for a second. She knew something. I could tell by her reaction to my question but it was also obvious that she wasn't going to tell me what it was. That night after my shift, I walked by the store. There are a few windows in that basement, the kind that are the high up ones, you know what I mean? Like they are at street level on the outside, but inside the basement, they are high up near the ceiling. Well, every time I passed by them before, they had been dark. This time though, I saw a faint green light coming out of them. My first thought was that it was just like Ghostbusters. It wasn't funny, though. It was actually scary because it pulsed and glowed like it was alive. And then there was a low scream that just kept going, like no brakes or anything. I guess it was more like between a scream and a moan. I felt like whatever was making that noise had just given up. That was the worst part. So now I think my next step will be the police but I'm sort of scared about bringing any unwanted attention on myself, so I'm still thinking that over. When I was a kid, I lived in rural Louisiana with my mom, dad, and two sisters. I was the middle kid, and middle kids tend to be the loners of the pack. I spent a lot of time out stomping around in the wilderness, but because of venomous snakes, alligators, and the like, my parents were constantly telling me that I needed to stick close to the house. Of course, I rarely listened to them and would find reason to sneak off as often as possible. Eventually, they gave up on trying to keep me corralled indoors and told me simply to be home by mealtimes to check in. It was summertime, and being summer, I hadn't seen my friends in weeks, because the only time I ever really went out was to go to school. 
With school closed and me so far from town, it took some effort to get to hang out with them. My mom always knew this was hard for us kids, so she'd plan a few slumber parties throughout the summer so that we could get our friends out to the house to hang out and catch up during the long break. One night she planned one of these get-togethers for me and my friends. My two best friends, Chris and Alex, came out to the house and mom made homemade pizza. We played Super Nintendo until our thumbs were sore, then decided to go outside and explore. Mom and Dad were always especially nervous about me taking friends out into the woods. I guess they figured that I was able to make my way around and avoid trouble, but it was too risky to take someone else's kids out there and potentially have them hurt or bit or lost or any number of strange things that can occur out in the swamplands of Louisiana. I told my friends we'd have to be quiet sneaking out so my mom wouldn't try to stop us. We were able to avoid her and soon were free to explore the outdoors. I took them down to the swamp and showed them alligator tracks in the mud, which kind of scared them so they wanted to head back to the house almost right away. I was regretting showing them the tracks though, because being outside was my favorite thing to do, and I was kind of dreading heading back inside to stare at the TV some more. There wasn't a lot else to do out there, and I felt like a bad host not having better entertainment options for my friends. In fact, I guess I kind of felt like they'd treat me like a loser or not want to hang out anymore if I didn't do something to keep them entertained. That's when I remembered there was a really cool old abandoned house out in the trees that always struck me as a likely haunted spot. It took a little bit of convincing, but my friends did agree to come with me to check it out, so we started heading that way. It was a massive house similar to the plantation-style homes that used to stretch out across the state, but not as big as most of them. It had the wide columns on the front porch and the wraparound balcony up top, though. Even before we got up to it, my friends were already impressed. There weren't any roads out there or anything anymore, so it was a very well-hidden secret. As we got close to the house, though, Alex suddenly stopped walking and started to dart back away, screaming. Chris and I both asked what the hell was going on, and Alex said there was something moving up on the balcony. We all stood there where we were and looked up. Sure enough, something was slithering along the balcony, occasionally showing itself through gaps in the wood banister. It looked like a huge snake, at least two feet in diameter in the fattest part of it, and it had to have been at least 20 feet long because we could see the tail end of it through the holes on one side of the porch and a thicker part of it at the opposite corner, although we had yet to see the head. I'm a naturally curious person, so I wanted to see it better. I started creeping up closer to it while the other two yelled at me to not go. They seemed almost angry with me that I was advancing on the thing, but I refused to stop and come back. Finally, I found a large stick and threw it as hard and as high as I could. The thing had the long body of a snake and easily the 20 feet in length, like I said. But at the head of this thing was a set of shoulders, two arms, and a head and face that looked almost human. It had yellow glowing eyes and was flicking its tongue as it slithered toward us, reaching its hands out like it couldn't wait to grab one of us up for a snack. Luckily, it wasn't a very fast mover. We were able to get away from it pretty easily and ran straight back to my parents' house. We spent about an hour sitting on the floor in my bedroom, panicking that the thing would follow us home, but we never did see it again. After that, my friends weren't too interested in visiting me out in the swamps, and I can't say I blame them. I didn't do much exploring after that either. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had in the 90s, back when I was in my 20s. This was a few decades ago, but I wouldn't be surprised to hear it was still happening in the area today. For background, I was living in New York City at the time and like many people just wanted to experience the big city. I had one job as a waitress and another at a call center overnight that was only four hours, three days a week. So it wasn't horrible, but I was pretty tired a lot. When I decided to move to New York, I answered ads for Roommate Wanted and ended up finding a girl around my age named Tara 
who had a really small two-bedroom that she was subletting, so I took the spot after talking to her back and forth for a bit. Even back then, apartments weren't cheap, and Tara and I were working our butts off to afford the smallest apartment ever. My bedroom was more like a closet and just barely fit a twin bed. For comparison, just the other day I went to look at colleges with my son, and college dorm rooms are bigger than the rooms we were sleeping in. Because we worked so much, we weren't home often, but we both had Sunday nights off and made that a kind of movie, takeout night if we could afford it that week. We'd go out and get a DVD, back when Blockbuster was still a thing, maybe grab Chinese food and stay in. One Sunday, we were getting back from grabbing our food and found our neighbor Marge out in the hall. Marge was an older woman who was kind of a curmudgeon. If you said hi to her, she'd only nod and she didn't like to chat. She wasn't social, so it was weird seeing her out in the hall, and Tara asked if she was okay. Marge looked anxious and was oddly chatty. She told us she'd seen someone out here from her peephole and kept hearing them, but when she would pop her head out, no one was there. Our building wasn't great and only had one staircase down to the first floor and a single elevator. We were on the fourth floor, and it would have been hard for someone to quickly hide if Marge opened the door to try and see them. Tara and I were skeptical, but said we'd keep an eye out. We left Marge in the hallway and went in to start our movie. We chatted a little about how weird that was, but dug into the food quickly and forgot about it. Then about 45 minutes into the movie, we both heard and kind of felt movement, like someone was hanging around outside the apartment door. The living area was the first area right inside the door, and the doors were pretty thin. We looked at each other and waited. The thudding of steps came again, and this time, we saw a shadow pass by slowly from under the edge of the door. I got up right away and went to the peephole. The only thing I saw was a glimpse of flannel moving toward Marge's apartment. Tara had paused the DVD, and I could hear the person continuing to walk down the hall, away from the staircase and elevator. I was too scared to open the door, but wanted to see if this was a neighbor. There was a guy and his wife who lived down that way. The footsteps stopped, but I didn't hear a door open. Tara had come over and grabbed an umbrella for protection, so I slid the lock, opened the door, and stuck my head out. There was no one there. A moment later, Marge's door opened, too, and she popped out and hissed, See? Tara and I were both a little scared now because I had definitely seen someone walk by the door. I told Marge it was probably the guy down at the end, but she said he and his wife were away visiting family in Connecticut. She was collecting their mail. Now we were extra weirded out. I went back in the apartment and just waited. Tara started the movie again, but we both stayed by the door. Within ten minutes we heard the footsteps again, going in the exact same direction. That was impossible since he'd already passed the door and I hadn't seen him go back that way. We were both tense and Whisper argued about what to do. Tara wanted to call the police. I said we should just leave it and keep the door locked. In the end, Tara won and we asked if they could send an officer down. I justified it because Marge was freaked out too, and it was the city. It took a while for the cop to get there. They talked to us and Marge and then went to look at security footage. The landlord only had cameras at the stairwell entrances, not down the hallway. We waited while they looked the footage over. Eventually, the cop came back and said everything should be fine, but they'd send officers to patrol past through the night to check. That made me and Tara feel a little better, but Tara asked the landlord about it. Asked him if anything was on the cameras. He explained that they had seen someone on the camera and the person in a red flannel walk down the hallway from the stairwell, but they never saw the person come back to the stairwell. Then, about ten minutes later, the video seemed to loop again, and the person showed up again walking down the hallway from the stairwell. It was like a glitch, but it was totally in line with what I'd seen and heard. Somehow they were getting back to the stairwell without us seeing, even though Marge and I had been watching. The landlord shared that Marge had told him about this happening before. Always with someone in a red flannel, every single time. Every time on the footage, the person did the same thing, started from the stairwell and walked down the hallway. They would do it five or ten times before disappearing. No one has ever seen this guy in person. Nothing was ever taken 
No apartments broken into, just a guy in red flannel walking down the hallway loudly and then completely disappearing. It really freaked Tara and me out. We talked to Marge a little bit about it that night and the cops came back, but nothing freaky happened again that night. We did experience it two more times before I ended up moving to a different building and Tara decided to go home to Pennsylvania. I guess third time was a charm for us. The building has changed name and ownership since then, but I'd be curious to know if anyone there is still experiencing a man in red flannel pacing the fourth floor hallway and disappearing. I hope you don't mind a little bit of a different kind of story from an old man who tried to be a fisherman once. It might be a little different than what you're used to, but I think it will be of some interest. In the mid-1960s, I bought my first fishing boat and started fishing for swordfish out of Gloucester. To be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing, and it was a business venture that was short-lived, mostly due to my absolute ineptitude as a fisherman, but also because after what happened on the night, I'm about to tell you about I didn't have the courage to go back out ever again. I had hired a crew of six. Benny and Jim were older guys that had been fishing swordfish most of their lives, so even though they weren't particularly as strong as the younger guys, they knew a ton. So I brought them on board to help teach me. Elaine was a tough old broad from the Boston area that had come to Gloucester chasing a man that didn't want her. After that didn't work out, she answered my help-wanted ad in search of some adventure. And anyway, I liked her spunk. Besides, she was about 5 foot 11 and tough as nails, so I knew she could pull weight. Toby, Nathan, and Greg were all three young men that had come to work for me after quitting a job with their old fishboat captain, who had underpaid them for some work. Needless to say, I had a good crew, but I personally wasn't cut out for the work. It had already started to become apparent to most of them that they were really the ones in charge out on the water, and it had started to create some animosity between me and my workers. They were wanting higher wages, and I was recognizing a growing need to assert myself as the boss. When we set off on that trip, Benny told me that the younger men had already talked Elaine into helping them confront me about their low paychecks once we were away from shore. The plan was they were simply going to get me out onto the water, then refuse to work if I didn't offer them a significant raise in wages. This would mean I'd have to take the loss coming back to shore with no fish, or I'd have to take a loss paying them better. Either way, I was pretty screwed because as a new boat owner I was already drowning in debt. I thought about turning around and docking the boat and telling them that I had already heard the plan, but Jim told me not to. He'd been through something similar before, years before, and he said that he'd help me negotiate something that would work for all of us. In hindsight, I'm pretty sure Benny and Jim were in on the ruse, and it was some kind of good cop, bad cop thing they were trying to pull. But however, it was meant to play out. I can only say it wound up being much, much weirder. As promised, as soon as it was too dark and we were too far out to turn the boat around and head back, I was called over to where all six crew members were gathered and waiting to speak to me. I already knew what was coming, so I took a deep breath and walked over to them. I figured I might as well get it over with and find out what the damage was going to be. No sooner did I step out, though, than I heard Toby yell, What in the heck is that? pointing out towards the water. We all turned and looked. The water was almost perfectly still except for one little funnel of water starting to twist up into the sky. It looked like the ocean was pouring a cup of tea upside down. We were a pretty good distance away. The only reason Toby even saw it was because that night the moon was shining brightly. At first, the funnel was only an inch or two wide, but the longer it twisted upward and the higher it got, the wider it spread out. Eventually, we started seeing it pull fish up with the water. It was all little fish at first, and they looked like they were swimming up the funnel toward the clouds. None of us knew what we were looking at. We all just stood around with our mouths wide open in disbelief. And remember, these were people who all knew the water very well. Then it wasn't little fish anymore. Huge swordfish, the kind we would have loved to have caught, started swimming upward into the sky. 
It was the darndest thing I'd ever seen. I remember one of the boys, I think Greg, asking us all if it was some kind of tornado, but that didn't make any sense because even though it was sucking water upward, it seemed to be sucking from the bottom of the ocean. The surface of the water was perfectly still. Our boat wasn't even rocking. Then all at once there were three or four bright flashes of light, bright enough that it looked like daylight out on the water, and then the funnel was gone. But the fish never fell back down. There was never any gust of wind. The water didn't move. Nothing. I looked back at the crew, who only moments ago had been about to tell me they wanted more money, and none of us could think of a single thing to say. Elaine asked Benny and Jim if they'd ever seen anything like that before and they both shook their heads. None of us knew anything about what we'd just seen, but I did know something. It was time to turn the boat around and head back to shore. I paid the crew for the whole week, despite us only being out on the boat for less than 18 hours, and told them it had been a pleasure and that I would be selling the boat. I did sell the boat and that's what basically saved my friendship with those six crew members. I hardly tell anyone this because it still freaks me out. Whenever I try to, my eyes tear up and my nose runs like I've been pepper sprayed or something. It's crazy. A few years back, I lived in Death Valley, working for a company that picks up used grease from restaurants. I used this special vacuum to suck up the grease, liquid chunks and all, into a tank that I'd wheel out to my truck. Early one morning on my first stop, a Mexican restaurant, I cleaned their grease trap and went to wheel the container out to my truck. Doesn't smell great. Some of this grease is rancid and smells fishy. But as I'm putting the container in the truck, I am trying to latch the door and it's giving me trouble. I hear this clicking sound behind the truck like a big bug. Then I'm in this cloud of stench, but it's not the grease, it's more sulfuric rotten eggs. I hold my breath, figuring it must be a sewage leak or something, but it gets stronger. And when I turn around, I see the eyes first, laser red, fixed on me. This creature, how do I even describe this? It was like a huge bag of bones formed itself into a skeleton hell horse. It had this wrinkled, leathery bat skin and wings, huge wings to match, which it stretched to full span in front of me, flapped a couple of times, then folded back onto its body. The eyes were sunken into its little skull. It was almost like its head was actually just a dark, hollow skull. It was like one of those prehistoric horse skeletons you see in a museum had come to life. I just froze, you know? I stood there thinking, do I play dead? Do I run? What the hell is this, and am I going to set it off somehow? Then it started to move toward me, its head bobbing up and down, but crawling in a serpentine motion. I stepped back and just ran. Now, this was not my best decision. It was just wide open desert out there. I could hear it behind me in the sand. Well, okay, so now I'm just getting that burning feeling in my eyes and nose. So I was running, then tripped and half fell, half rolled in the sand. When I looked up, the creature was running into the desert, but away from me. In the distance, I could see a person on horseback, far off, like they were coming in from a sunset ride. I got up and I started waving my arms like a maniac. I'm like, hey, hey, move, move, run. But they didn't seem to hear me, and the creature was closing in on them. Just as it looked like it was about to pounce, the horse kicks it so hard in the head that I can hear crack, bone cracking and the thing just drops. The rider tries to circle back to approach the creature, but the horse is having none of it right. The horse is freaking out, backing up. I haul ass back to my truck and I dial 911. Takes forever for someone to answer and I blurt out where I am and I sound insane, saying I think I've seen an alien or something. But before I can even finish, they hang up on me. I back up, then remember, I never latched the back of the truck where the grease container is sitting. I get out and try to latch it, but it's still sort of stuck open. I decided I'm just going to leave the grease bin there behind the restaurant, come back for it later with another truck, or better yet, send someone else to do it. My heart is still pounding. I'm completely scared. 
I look into the desert, and you know sure enough I still see the shadowy hump of the creature's body out there. I pull the grease container out and roll it to the back of the restaurant. As I'm about to get in my truck, one of the owners comes out and looks at me, sniffs the air that still smells like rotten eggs, and wipes his eyes. He looks out at the desert and shouts over his shoulder to someone in the kitchen, Hey Otro! There's another one. And he says to me, looking serious, You didn't see anything, right? And I stare at him, and I start getting this burning sensation in my nose and eyes, and I say, No, nothing. As I drive away, I pass a police van with barred windows, one they might use to transport prisoners coming toward the restaurant, along with a plain white cargo van behind it. One of the cops gives me a little two-finger peace wave and a nod. No blues on, just driving fast and quiet. I see them pull over at the restaurant where the owner is greeting them, gesturing excitedly toward the desert. So, get this. The next week I get a personal check for $1,000 from the restaurant with a note thanking me for my services but that from now on they'd be cleaning up their own messes. I'm thinking obviously this is a regular occurrence, right? But I mean, who knew about it? The guy on horseback, the restaurant, the cop, all of them? Sometimes when I'm awake at night thinking about it, I can actually smell it. For weeks I read the police blotter in our little local paper and nothing. I want to go back there, take a look around, maybe find the guy on the horse. I wonder where that thing came from, and most of all, where they hid the body. I just got back to Buffalo, New York from San Francisco, and I've never been so happy to be home. I never thought anything creepy would happen in California. I mean, it's sunny and cheerful all the time, right? I had to go there for three nights for a conference, and I was glad to go since it's winter in New York. I was looking forward to some good weather, and I did get that. The days were fine, it was the nights that got crazy. Okay, so the first day I didn't do much. We had kind of a meetup in the hotel ballroom, which was set up as a bar. Maybe I drank a little too much, and I thought at first that might explain what happened later. See, I got back to my hotel room and sort of collapsed into bed. Between the flight across the country and one too many whiskey sours, I'd had enough for a while. I didn't even turn on the TV. I also forgot to turn my phone on sleep mode, which turned out to be a good thing. Sometime around 3 or 4 in the morning, I woke up. I felt like something was watching me. I knew I'd thrown the deadbolt and put that blocker thing on the door that they have now instead of chains. No one could have come in and yet someone or something was there. I felt it, and then in the tiny bit of streetlight coming in through the curtains, I saw it standing at the end of my bed. I sat up in bed so fast that I hit my head on the headboard. It was this hunched-over, pale-skinned creature with dead black eyes that were too big for its head. "'What do you want?' I said. It didn't answer, just made this creepy clicking noise. I don't know, like a really loud clock maybe, or just someone clicking their tongue, but loud. I was seriously creeped out and didn't know what to do. It started to inch forward, clicking the whole time. I didn't realize I was moving backwards until my back hit the wall. Then I heard barking, and it took me a minute to figure out what it was. I got this friend Josh, and he's part of the reason I always put my phone on sleep mode. He'll get drunk and call me in the middle of the night sometimes. I put his ringtone for barking. I don't know why, just because it's funny, I guess. All I could think was thank God for Josh, because the creature flinched when it heard the barking. I didn't answer the phone. I knew it would only ring four times before it went to voicemail. Luckily, when Josh is drunk, he'll call over and over again. When the barking started again, the creature left. I don't know how it got out of the room, it was just gone. Josh called again and this time I picked up. I listened to him drunkenly ranting about his girlfriend not wanting to go to a bar with him or something. It was comforting, and I actually fell back asleep. The next morning I was sure it was a dream. It couldn't have been real, right? It was just too crazy. I went and did all the conference stuff and tried to forget about it. But when I got back to the room that night, I remembered again. What if it wasn't a dream? What if it came back? I put my phone next to me on the nightstand. If the thing showed up, I'd play the barking ringtone again. I didn't think it would, but it seemed like I'd been asleep for just a few seconds when I felt those creepy eyes on me again. 
It was clicking, just like before, staring at me. I didn't bother to talk to it this time, I just grabbed the phone and put on that ringtone. It didn't move, just kept staring. I turned on the phone light and shined it right at its face. That was a mistake, because it looked even worse in the light. The light reflected off those black eyes, and they looked even deader. And the skin, like you could almost see through it, red and blue veins. I didn't know whether to throw up, run, or scream. I fumbled my phone and dropped it. I grabbed the nearest thing, which was one of those laser pointers you use to point at stuff during presentations. I shined that in its eyes, and then it finally backed off. I moved toward it, shining that laser pointer and trying not to act scared. I got my phone with the other hand and played the dogs again. It clicked louder, but finally left. This time I knew it wasn't a dream. I went down to the hotel lobby and asked to change rooms, told them the neighbors were loud. They didn't argue. I thought that had to be the end of it. I had just one night left and I hoped it would be quiet. At three in the morning that thing woke me up again. I know I said that I thought it was over, but I also didn't because I slept in my clothes and put my packed bag right by the door. So, when the thing showed up, I was prepared. I jumped up, ran over the bed, and got to the door. The thing was right behind me, clicking, and I think it was gnashing its teeth, too. I was so scared that I couldn't get the door open at first. I forgot I had that blocking thing over it, and it took me a few seconds to remember how to move it. That clicking was driving me nuts. I opened that door so fast that I almost fell down. I shoved my bag out, got out, and slammed the door behind me. I got a ride from my rideshare app, went straight to the airport, and changed to an earlier flight. I know it was the rake. I hope I never see anything like that again. I'm a spelunker living near the Catskill Mountains of New York. For those who aren't familiar with spelunking, it's basically cave exploring. This can be a dangerous hobby, and for those of us serious about it. So, we make sure to use the right equipment and always go with a group. Research is also important. There are countless reports of spelunkers who have died or disappeared in cave systems because they were ill-prepared and didn't know what they were getting into. I've been spelunking since I was a kid and I've seen weird things here and there, but I wanted to share this particular story that happened more recently. Most of what we see in the caves are signs of people living there, hopefully just temporarily, and junk left behind. Once my sister and I found a stray dog that we helped find its way out. A few weeks ago, when the weather was warm and dry, four friends and I decided to head to one of our favorite spelunking caves in the Catskills. I'm not going to mention the name of this cave since it was in the news a few years ago for a guy getting injured. He wasn't prepared and ended up falling and breaking his heel. But I'd been there a few times with these same friends, and we knew what we were getting into. We'd brought the basic gear and were setting up in a small, clear area not too far from the entrance, maybe 200 or 300 feet. Like I said, it was pretty dry and we had hot weather so we were sure to pack a ton of water. There were smaller trees around us, but mainly pine trees growing on and around the rocky outcroppings near the cave entrance. I finished getting ready first and stood up to double check that all of my gear, including my helmet, was on properly. We were chatting about what we should do later in the day, maybe find a brewery or just head home and order pizza. Two of my four friends were visiting from out of state, so this was a sort of vacation for them. As the others started to stand and check themselves, I heard a snapping sound off to my left near the cave. I glanced back that way assuming it was a smaller animal. In the woods, a lot of small animals can sound large, so I don't usually get worried unless I see something to worry about. I scanned the area, didn't see anything, and went back to chatting. Then the smell came. This smell was unlike anything I'd smelled before like someone left a pile of beef rotting in a trash can for weeks. It was so bad I could practically taste it, and from the looks on my friends' faces, they could too. We all instinctively held our arms over our noses and immediately started looking around for the source. My initial thought was that we were about to find a body. 
but it also seemed odd that the smell came so suddenly. We'd been in the area for at least half an hour at this point, and if there was a rotting body nearby, we would have smelled it sooner. One friend broke off from the group, picked up a large stick and started poking and searching the foliage to the right, away from the cave. I was looking more carefully into the woods now, and as I turned around slowly, I saw something near the cave. At first I thought it was a buck because of the antlers, pretty big, an eight point, and noticeable as it was about 200 feet away from us near the cave. I froze because something was off. In my experience, deer usually run, but this one didn't. One of my friends, Trisha, caught on quickly and froze too. The others noticed we were looking at something and soon we were all staring at it. The deer, or what we had thought was a deer, unfolded suddenly and got a few feet taller, which gave me the sensation that I was hallucinating. The thing then shifted closer to the opening of the cave, and a second later we were hit with that horrible smell again. It was sunny, but with light coming through the trees, it looked like the body, on two legs by the way, had these spots of light coming through it, like there were holes in it or something. It moved a few feet closer, and the smell got so bad I actually gagged. Another guy and I grabbed big branches and started backing up. My friend Dave, the one who had been looking around in the bushes, asked, What the hell is that thing? Trisha grabbed her pack and started rushing backward toward the trail we'd come up. The rest of us broke out of our scared trances and did the same, scrambling back to the trail and then jogging down it. Dave was the last one out, and he kept looking back and hollering that he didn't see it, which was a relief but didn't stop the adrenaline rush. Within ten minutes we reached where we'd parked the car and all piled in. It was a complete mess. We still had our gear on and we were all out of breath. Leighton was driving and gunning it back toward town. Once we cleared the deepest part of the woods, we started talking about what we'd seen and comparing. We were all on the same page. It had definitely been a creature with a buck's head, standing on two legs, and it looked like it was decaying. Trisha, who had been a little closer, said the eye sockets were empty. That same day when we hunkered down in a deli for lunch, everyone did some digging online and the best we could come up with was that there was a wendigo up there at the cave. I'm assuming it was just passing through since we'd been there before and hadn't seen it, and there weren't any reports of it up there. But that's a cave we won't be visiting again, not for a while or without protection. Petey was attacked two weeks ago by a hideous creature. I saw it with my own eyes and reported it to my town's animal control, but they're not doing anything about it. Petey is a rescued pit bull and is the sweetest baby. He would never be aggressive unless he thought someone was threatening me. And that's how he got himself into this mess. I live in Locust, North Carolina, and we have a lot of woods here. Even though I'm a woman in my 40s living alone, I was never afraid at night because Petey would always let me know if anything strange was going on anywhere near the house. I don't believe in those electric fence things, and I don't tie my animals up by their necks, so sometimes when he needed to go outside to do his business, I'd just let him out in the yard and stand by the door and watch him. This was never a problem for us. My property has a stretch of woods in the backyard that goes on for a ways, but Petey was well-trained and he would always come right in when I whistled. So two weeks ago, when I was watching him from the screen door and I saw him go into the woods, I was really surprised when I whistled and he didn't come right back. I was only wearing my bedroom slippers at the time because I work from home, so I had to go back into the house and put on some shoes before I went after him. I buy him these special real meat treats that he loves, so I grabbed a few of those and put them in my pocket on the way out the door. I walked through the woods for maybe five minutes calling his name and clapping my hands and didn't see any sign of him, and I was really getting worried. So I stopped for a minute and listened. Maybe it was because of me walking through there, but it seemed to me that the forest was unnaturally still. No birds or anything. Even after I was quiet for a few minutes, they didn't start back up. It kind of got me a little wary. I went a little way further and called his name some more. All at once, I saw something ahead of me in the brush. There was this creature that looked like a wolf, only bigger. 
We have coyotes around here, but no wolves. So I was squinting at it, trying to figure out if it was just a big dog. Coyotes aren't very big. It was kind of far away, and down on all fours at that moment, so I had no reason to think it was anything supernatural. I've always been told don't act like your prey if you see something in the woods, so I acted big, so to speak, and yelled at it, Go on! Get out of here! Unfortunately, I didn't scare it one bit. Instead, it turned and looked at me, dead on, locking eyes with me. The hair on the back of my neck rose when I saw that thing's face. It had the most sinister yellow eyes, glowing like a deer's eyes do in the headlights. Its face looked off for a regular dog or even a wolf too. The jaw was especially large and the ears seemed taller. But those eyes, man, that was the really freaky part. I couldn't look away. The beast made a low growling sound and my blood just froze in my veins. All those brave ideas about yelling so you don't look like prey just went out of my head in an instant. I was just paralyzed with fear. I could barely breathe and I'm sure I was giving off some kind of fear scent that it was picking up on. The creature sniffed the air then, keeping its eyes on me but raising its muzzle to scent the air, and I then realized it could also probably smell those special dog treats. Talk about appearing as prey. Right then the thing was certainly smelling the meat in my pocket. My ears started ringing and my heart was hammering like it was trying to pound right out of my chest. I just slowly backed up a step and then another one, not sure of what else to do. All at once it rose up on its hind legs. I couldn't believe my eyes. It stood up, crouched over a little, but up on two feet and it must have been seven feet tall. It roared just like a grizzly bear, not like a dog or a wolf, just this enraged roar and leapt toward me. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran, knowing this thing was going to kill me. I hadn't gone very far when all of a sudden I heard Petey barking, and I turned around to look. Petey came racing out of the woods and launched himself at the beast. I screamed, No! watching totally horrified as he clamped down on the creature's side. He hung there the way pit bulls will, just suspended halfway up the thing by the strength of his jaw, swinging. That monster just swiped at him, roaring, and I saw its claws scrape across my poor Petey's side. I know I sound like a coward, but I was no match for this creature. I turned and ran, whistling for Pete and hoping he would heed all his training and follow me. I ran all the way home and only looked back once I reached the door. Thank God Petey was right behind me and we both jumped through the door, locked it and 911. I said there was some really big wild animal in the woods behind my house and that it tried to attack me and that it got hold of my dog. Animal control came out, arriving in about a half hour. I had spent that whole time sobbing my eyes out, knowing that we had just narrowly escaped being killed. I saw one of the officers arrive and start to head out with that stick thing with the loop on the end, and I told him, that ain't gonna do it, mister. You need a gun. He told me to wait in the house. They were gone about 15 or 20 minutes, which didn't seem like enough time at all, and they arrived back with basically no information. I remember wondering if they had just gone out looking for show and didn't really expect to find anything. They didn't find the creature, and the one officer insisted it was just another dog that had fought with him. Nothing I said could convince them it was a seven-foot-tall creature that was walking upright. It was not a dog. But the more I tried to explain myself, the more I realized I looked like a crazy woman. Trying to tell them about a monster amid my shaking and being unable to really get the words out clearly. Who knew what they thought of me? For many weeks after that, Petey and I didn't leave each other's side. I'm not sure who needed who more, but I'm guessing the need was pretty equal at that point. Let's just hope we never have to deal with that again. Disclosure. For privacy, the names and year this happened have been changed. This was one of the creepiest, chilling things me and my friends experienced. Yosemite is one of the most beautiful spiritual places, as well as terrifying and creepy. It's like Snow White with razor blades, both beautiful and dangerous. I have never felt or seen anything like this place. 
In April of 2019, I took a trip out to California to see some friends. I had lived in Los Angeles with this particular friend, let's just call her Katie, just several years ago. And since then, she got married and now lives in Northern California with her husband, Ed. They are avid expert hikers, especially her husband. He's been hiking all his life with his family all over the country and teaches wilderness survival part-time, so I felt like I was in good hands with him. We were in the woods Easter weekend. More on that in a bit. The first few days we were out there, everything went as planned. We even went a bit deeper into the forest than we had planned because he wanted to show me a few things. This made my friend a bit nervous because she knew there was a certain point that no one goes any further. A lot weirder things happen the deeper you go, but he was one of those guys who pushed the limits of everything. I'm serious when I tell you there is absolutely no one out there, or so we thought. I was able to keep up with them. As you can imagine, they are in incredible shape. They had to stop a few times for me, but we were doing okay. About four days in, we were almost done. It was the eve of Easter Sunday and we had planned on camping out one more night before we made it back to the truck. So, our last night we found a spot and set up camp. They were in a tent, and I was in my own. The first few nights I was a bit creeped out, but by the fourth night I was so exhilarated by this magical place, I had been sleeping peacefully. And between the fresh air and hiking, I was usually out as soon as I laid down. This night we had made a fire and had something to eat. It was getting dark, and off in the distance we heard some drumming. This went on for about an hour. It seemed to get louder, and then it would die down. It stopped for a while, and then it started up again. We could see a light coming up from the forest. Ed said they had a pretty big fire going. Apparently, he had a few forest ranger friends, and they had told him there are rituals that take place out there. They pick the middle of nowhere because they can do what they need to do and not be bothered. This was terrifying to me and Katie. We both suggested we head back in the dark and get out of there, but Ed said no, we'll leave as soon as the sky breaks tomorrow morning. We were all quiet at this point, and I brought my sleeping bag in the tent. He told us to just be quiet and try to sleep, but that wasn't happening. Shortly after the drumming got louder, we heard some kind of loud Latin-sounding chanting coming from a group of people. It sounded like at least 20 people or more, followed by some screaming and yelling. It went silent for what seemed like a few minutes, then like a knife piercing the night. A woman started screaming. You could hear what sounded like gasping and trying to catch her breath. It was a guttural, primal, painful, blood-curdling scream that went on for about 10 minutes. No doubt she was being murdered and sacrificed. We sat there frozen in the tent. With the light of the flashlight in the sleeping bag, I could see the silhouette of Katie's body hunched over, moving up and down with her hand over her mouth, quietly sobbing. I sat there in shock. I could feel my heart beating heavily in my chest, and my legs started shaking with the amount of adrenaline running through my body. The sounds that woman was making during the last horrifying moments of her life will haunt me forever. I wanted out of there, but there's no way we could go 18 miles in the dark back to the truck. Then suddenly her screams stopped. The forest was deathly quiet. It's like every living thing took notice and stopped. Then a male voice started chanting again, followed by more drumming. This went on for what seemed like a few more hours until somehow I managed to fall asleep. I was woken by Katie shaking me, telling me to hurry up, we're going. I was somewhat relieved to see a bit of light coming into the tent, but barely. Ed said he heard something by the tent the rest of the night, and any one of those people could more than likely still out there. We packed up, and it had to be the longest 18 miles. We were supposed to enjoy this hike back with the beautiful scenery, but I felt like we were running for our lives. We barely said a word, and we went as fast as we could, not making a sound. Me and Katie were constantly looking back to make sure we were alone, and nothing was following us. I was never so happy to see Ed's truck and some civilization. Not that anyone could do anything about it, but this was reported, and he later contacted a friend who said they have a lot of these reports around the solstices, full moons, and specifically on Easter. There is a dark connection to that holiday, and that's specifically when they use adults for human sacrifice. Katie hasn't been hiking since, but Ed still goes with friends now and then. 
She still brings up that woman and wonders who she was and if she had family. I took a hike out in the Glen Canyon area of Utah. We weren't in Glen Canyon itself, but more on the outskirts. We'd driven a few states west with a group of four other friends in a shared caravan and had been at it for about a week and a half before we started getting sick of each other. Jared and I decided to go on a solo hike by ourselves to get a little space from the others and wind down. We left our four friends back at the RV park, and after seeing the crowds at Glen Canyon, this was in late June, decided to find a less popular trail. We always hike prepared, so I wasn't too worried about going off the main trails. We bring extra food, matches, water, and both of us have compasses too. I even had a paper map of the area. We found a trail that looked more like a scratched up area over some rocks and dug in. It was a tough start to the hike and the elevation ratcheted up quickly until we were up probably almost a thousand feet in less than half an hour. This area of Utah is stereotypically rocky, think like those beige rock formations you see on postcards, and can be really dangerous. There are a lot of little canyons, crevices, and grooves to shimmy up. At one point I was pretty sure we weren't on the trail anymore, and mentioned this to Jared. We took a break to eat a few granola bars and check the map. After a few minutes we figured out where we were, and I was right. We definitely weren't on a trail. However, the surrounding area looked passable, so we decided to continue exploring until the going got a little more tough. The elevation rose a bit higher in the next half hour, and when I checked my cell, I didn't have any reception. But the views were beautiful, so I just passed some time by taking a lot of photos. Jared called me over to an area that wasn't exactly flat, but kind of plateaued. We'd been looking for our next way up when he pointed at a section of rock wall. It was rough, but there were numbers carved into the rock. At first, I thought we'd found some kind of ancient civilization carvings. They aren't uncommon out in this area, but I realized they were just regular Arabic numerals, like one, two, three, but a whole string of numbers that, when we looked closer, appeared to have been stamped in the stone. I looked at Jared, but he didn't know what could have done that, especially out in the middle of nowhere like this. I snapped a photo of the string of numbers and after getting over an uneasy feeling we kept going a little further. We'd found a very shallow gully that went up and had to brace our feet almost sideways to climb it. This ended in a sort of canyon area. Around the rim of and at the base of the canyon was stagnant water. It had rained a few days ago, so this wasn't surprising. I told Jared I wanted a break because, to be honest, I was kind of weirded out about the numbers. I sat down to drink some water while he wandered around the rim for a little, and within a few minutes, he was calling to me. Honestly, I didn't want to go in case he found something more disturbing, but I didn't want to be alone either, especially now that I felt off. So I got up and carefully made my way over to him. He'd found a wide crevice in the rim that dropped down a few feet and was down inside there. He had to duck down to fit, but when he scooted to the side, I could see a metal door pressed into the rock. It looked unreal and industrial with wide bolts and trim. There wasn't a handle that I could see anywhere, so I'm not sure you could even call it a door. I told Jared to get out of there, but he banged around on the metal for a bit before finally listening. I probably sounded really distraught. We were in such a remote area, and after the strange numbers punched into the rocks, I had no idea what we were dealing with here. Humans must have made both the numbers and the door, but why? What was behind the door? With it being so remote, it made it seem like whatever it was was dangerous or secret. As soon as Jared climbed back up, I told him I wanted to leave now. He tried to cajole me into hanging out and poking around a bit more, but I could tell he thought this was a weird find too. We hiked back out much faster than we'd come in, and that night at the RV, Jared told our friends what we'd found. If it was up to me, I don't think I ever would have mentioned it. At first they laughed, but I think the look on my face convinced them we weren't kidding. There were a few theories flying around, including that it was some kind of government hideout. I have no idea what they would do at such a remote location, especially since it was tough to get there, but I guess it would be a good place to hide things if that's what's happening there. 
Since the door was essentially smooth with no visible lock or door handle, I'm not sure how anyone would even get in, or what those carved numbers in the rock were for. I'd be interested to hear if anyone else has come across the numbers and door, but I don't suggest anyone go looking for it. It was about nine or ten years ago that this happened, and I'm still affected by it. I've heard a lot of wild camping stories from people I know, but nothing like this. I've always been an avid backpacker, and I like to get into some pretty remote places. I mostly go alone since my friends aren't as into it as I am. Yeah, I know that's not the best idea. And now I really know. I had wanted to explore New Mexico, so I made plans to hike one spring into the Bandelier Wilderness. The wilderness covers an expanse of over 23,000 acres, all within New Mexico, and I was planning to spend the better part of a week checking out as much of it as I could. I spent the first night sleeping under a gorgeous starry sky and listening to the crickets. It felt great to be out there. And then by the second day, I was over 20 miles into the wilderness. Near the end of that second day, I came across a fresh mule deer kill in the canyon. I had seen mountain lion kills before and this looked like that's what it was. Usually a fresh kill means the hunter is close, which also meant potential trouble since hunting was prohibited, making this poaching. So I was on heightened alert and on the lookout for any signs. However, once I climbed out of the canyon, my mind didn't dwell on it and I didn't give it too much thought after that. I was hiking along the rim of the canyon and I found a nice sheltered sandstone ledge with a shallow cave area on one side. The cliff of the canyon was about 15 feet away, and I had a clear view of everything to the south and west, with the canyon directly north of me. It seemed like a perfect place to spend the night. I was only a few hundred yards up from where I had noticed the kill before. I got my tent set up and anchored down. I ate my dinner and was just leaning back against the sandstone and staring at the sky. It had just gotten dark and I was about to doze off when I heard this blood-curdling howl. I jumped to my feet and soon heard it again. I grabbed for my flashlight, trying not to get stabbed by the cactus or fall off the cliff. I wanted to assess the situation but once I got the flashlight on it didn't help me find the source of the howl. It sounded close and angry, which got me to thinking that the animal would scent me. I hadn't showered in a few days and was pretty ripe. The howl came again, and it was unearthly. And unbelievably loud. I had heard some wild noises in the mountains before, but not like that. It sounded like a whooping noise, and it seemed to be coming from the east, which was the only direction I didn't have a view toward. I thought about packing up and leaving, but then I realized I'd be a fool to try to outrun a mountain lion in the dark. I decided my only choice at that point was to wait and see what happened. I had a few big rocks collected and my mace in my hand. I also had my hiking poles, which would be a better defense than nothing. I heard another howl that sounded farther away, but then I didn't hear any more. By now the moon was rising and it was about three quarters full and really bright, so I had some night vision at least. I was crouched there on my sandstone cliff, listening like crazy, but after a long time of listening and nothing further happening, I decided to get into my tent and try to sleep. I was exhausted, and so actually fell asleep pretty quick. I don't know how much time had gone by, but I think it was at least a few hours later when I was woken up by these rustling noises outside my tent and a terrible smell that hadn't been there before. The moon was shining brightly at that point. I peeked out of the tent window, and I could see something big and shadowy moving around. It didn't seem at all like a mountain lion. The shadow was huge and bulky and really tall. It was moving all around my tent and shuffling in a way that made it seem really heavy. And then I watched it as it put its paw on my tent. I could even clearly see the outline against the nylon. I say paw, but I almost want to say hand. Like a huge ape-like hand, like at least twice the size of a full-grown man's hand. It was terrifying. The hand was moving back and forth, rubbing the tent, almost in a way that seemed that it had probably never felt something like that before. All I could do was lay there, 
I mean, what else could I do? There was nowhere to go expect right into the thing. I didn't know if it would be better to be silent or if I should make some threatening noises. Ultimately, I decided to just lay low and stay silent so as not to rile it up. I lay there imagining how long it was going to take someone to find my mauled body out there in the back country. It would probably be weeks and weeks and I would be a skeleton by then. That thing must have spent at least 10 minutes shuffling around and feeling my tent. The smell of it was nearly overpowering. I could hardly stand it and twice had to hold back gagging. And then I heard what sounded like it was shuffling away. I didn't sleep, and I didn't get up to look. I waited all night. It didn't come back. I got myself together at sunrise and packed up as quietly as I could. I was really wishing and hoping that the thing was nocturnal and would be gone by daybreak. I started hiking out, but as far in as I was, I didn't have any choice but to spend another night out there. Luckily, despite me barely sleeping, nothing else happened. When I got back to my truck the next day, I was just a wreck from not sleeping for two nights and hiking all that way. I got home safely, but swore to myself that I would never go out again without a weapon. I don't share this story too often, but here you go. I was born and raised in Alaska. The older I get, the more I realize how great it was to have the childhood I did. Growing up in a small town off the road system was amazing. Our parents made sure we took advantage of all the opportunities that were available. We got used to being outside all the time as kids. We would camp, hunt, and fish when we were really young. By the time I was an older teenager, I was just about fully independent. My parents trusted me to be out and about alone quite often. I loved to get out in the wilderness and explore whenever I could. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was very normal to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. The winter is long up there, and I spent a lot of time under the stars. It was incredibly beautiful for anyone who didn't mind the cold too much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few miles out of town and just lay down on the snow looking up at the sky. The northern lights were also a pretty common sight. It wasn't something that happened every day, but often enough that people up there were pretty used to it. Now that I live in the lower states, I realize how many people would just love to see them. But up there, they started seeming ordinary after a while. On this one night, I had a lot on my mind and couldn't get to sleep. I decided to go out on one of my midnight drives. I didn't tell my parents and they were probably asleep anyway, but I knew they wouldn't mind. I took the snowmobile and drove a few miles over the hills. I wanted to find a spot without any light pollution from the town. I shut off the engine and settled into a good spot to look up and have some good thinking time. I was in a relationship that was kind of driving me crazy and I was trying to decide what to do about it. At first it was just the usual scene. I watched a few satellites passing over here and there. I picked out the constellations that I knew but after a while I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snowmobile cooling down, like the engine expanding and contracting in the cold, but then I realized the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. I sat up and looked around thinking maybe there was some animal nearby. I was prepared to get out of there fast in that case. I didn't want to be dealing with a wild animal in the middle of the night but I thought the clicking sounded way too regular for it to be coming from an animal. Also, it was pretty mechanical sounding. The more I listened, the more I realized that the sound seemed to be coming from above and in front of me. I was staring upward and just seeing what I usually saw. Stars, some northern light action, a satellite crossing the sky. All normal things. I laid back down trying to get to a peaceful state of mind. After a while, I was getting too cold and was about ready to head home. But I noticed something looked odd in the Aurora Borealis. There were three super bright points of light. At first, I thought they were stars, but they were too perfectly placed. And they were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring and watched them continue to get brighter and brighter. At this point, I swore the clicking noise was getting louder and louder. Then it just stopped. The lights were gone and the clicking wasn't there. 
and everything actually sounded extra quiet. I was getting pretty stiff and cold, and maybe slightly spooked. I got up to leave, and then all of a sudden, this bright three-orbed object was hovering above me, much closer now than those three lights had been. The clicking was loud now. It was triangle-shaped with one light orb on top and two underneath, all simultaneously moving together. I bet 10 to 20 seconds passed, but it felt like an hour. Then all of a sudden it went from hovering to hitting warp speed in the blink of an eye, and it shot off to the horizon and disappeared. I jumped on the snowmobile, and don't you know it was taking longer than usual to start up. I was starting to worry, but then it was running, and I headed to my house. My mind was full of speculation, wondering if what I saw was some kind of weird behavior of the northern lights that I'd never heard about. I pulled up to my house thinking I had to get inside and get to bed without waking anyone up. But then I saw the windows were all lit up, which was really strange. I'm now wondering why my parents would be up at like two in the morning. I had left around midnight and was gone for maybe two hours. I went into the house and my mom was awake and standing in the kitchen making coffee. I looked at the kitchen clock and it said six in the morning. I just stared at the clock, not understanding. Then I realized I must have been out there staring at those clicking lights for like six hours. There was no way, but I sure couldn't argue with the time. I ended up telling my mom and dad the whole story. They were just blown away by it all. But they're the kind of parents who know me well and know that I wouldn't make stuff like that up. I never even ended up going to bed at all that day. That was one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. My story starts with a regular cat, but I promise you it gets weird really quick. Stormy is the cat, and she belongs to my mother. She just showed up at our door a couple years ago like she belonged there, and of course mom let her in. Oh, before I go on, I should tell you we live in Grand, Michigan, which is a pretty small town, less than 1,000 people. There are mostly woods around us, and we have to go to Traverse City, which is just under an hour away if we want anything, really. Stormy the Cat is kind of old now, so she doesn't go outside much. She sits on top of a bookshelf on a pillow Mom put there for her and looks out the window at the woods. It's like the window is her TV. Most of the time, she's pretty quiet unless she feels the need to yowl at a squirrel or something. But one night in the fall, I was sitting near the fireplace reading when I heard her make a noise I never heard before. It was like between a yowl and a shriek. I looked over at her and I thought she was having a seizure. She hissed and spit and got herself so worked up she fell off the shelf. I was all ready to take her to the emergency vet in Traverse City, but she picked herself and walked away from the window like she was fine. She didn't get back up on her shelf until the next morning, though. A few nights later, it happened again, but this time, I figured out that she was hissing at something outside the window. I went to look, but there's no outside lights on that side of the house. No reason to have them there since it's just the woods behind. I couldn't see anything in that window except my own reflection and Stormy freaking out. She seemed more focused this time, like if she hissed enough at whatever it was, she could scare it off. I went out the back door with a flashlight and shone it around, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I went out there and I saw some deer tracks. Except they were weird, set next to each other as if the deer had been standing on two legs. That made no sense, so I figured it was just that some of the hooves didn't dig in deep enough to make a mark. I decided to go over to old George's house, the neighbor next door, and ask him if he'd seen or heard anything strange. I figured probably he'd say no, and the cat was just freaked out by a wolf or a coyote. Thing is, we'd had Stormy for years, and there were always wolves and coyotes around and she'd never acted like this before. This was new. Old George lives alone since his wife passed away. He's not a man who has any truck with superstitions or that kind of thing. He was a lumberman before he retired and spent a lot of time in the woods. You know, like a man's man kind of guy. I figured if anyone would know if there were strange creatures out there, it would be him. 
I walked over and found him splitting wood behind his house like he was 20 years old and not 68. He put down the axe when he saw me coming and said, You hear about the Wendigo? What's that? I asked. The Ojibwe know about him. That's where I heard about it, old George said. He'd been hanging around lately. I figured you knew that. I don't know anything, I told him. All I know is Mom's cat is freaking out because something's outside her window at night. It's the Wendigo, he said, looking for something to eat, but not a cat. So what do I do? How do I get rid of it? I asked him. I could hardly believe I was actually acting like what he said was true. But I'd never known old George to lie or tell stories. He's just not that kind of guy. Come inside, George said. His house is like you'd expect. Wood-burning stove, old farmer's almanacs, and a few Native American blankets thrown over the old wooden furniture. He opened his cupboard and got out a worn leather bag. When the Wendigo comes again, open this bag and toss it at it. Don't open it before that. I reluctantly took the bag from him but agreed to do what he said. Back home, I didn't tell Mom about all this because I didn't want to scare her. She's pretty sick these days and mostly just stays in her room. But I hung on to the bag and waited. A few nights later, I was sitting in the living room reading as usual when Stormy started to do her thing. She was hissing and spitting, staring out that window where I could see nothing. When I started to go outside, she followed right at my heels. I was sure to have that bag right with me and ready. As soon as we stepped out the door, Stormy let out a yowl like a tomcat in heat. I squinted into the dark and saw something that looked like red eyes at the edge of the wood. I swung Mom's big flashlight in that direction, and I almost dropped it when I saw exactly what George said was out there, the Wendigo. That thing was like a rotting deer standing on its back legs, but more than just rotting, it was like a zombie from the movies. Fur and flesh like dripped off it. The skull poked through the half-rotten skin of its face, and it seemed like it was grinning at me. It didn't make a sound, but somehow I knew from the looks of it that it wanted to eat me. The wind must have shifted just then because I caught the horrible smell of death, like that time Stormy killed a mouse and it died under the refrigerator and Mom and I didn't find it for a week. I wasn't sure I could throw the bag far enough, but I had to try. I loosened the drawstring and cocked my arm back just like I was throwing a baseball. I let it go and it flew right toward those red eyes. I swear I just blinked, and the thing was gone. I wasn't taking any chances, though, and I scooped up Stormy and ran back into the house with her. She hopped back up onto her pillow at the window, but now she was acting like a normal cat, just looking out the window with her tail flicking back and forth. The next morning, I went out to retrieve the bag for George and see what was in it, but the bag had also completely disappeared. I have no idea if it disappeared with the Wendigo or if something or someone came and took it after the fact. All George will say about it is, that's just the way it works, and I'm not really interested in pressing him for any further details. Basically, I'm just happy that the Wendigo hasn't been back. Maybe old George's voodoo bag worked. I think the government's doing all kinds of stuff they don't want us to know about. Honestly, I don't know if I'd believe it as much, except that it's happening right down the street. See, I live just outside Billings, Montana, and about a half mile down from me is this old abandoned factory. At least I thought it was abandoned. I've been here for 10 years or so, and for the last nine, nothing's gone on there. Just a hulking structure with busted out windows, crumbling brick, probably rats too. Can't tell what it used to be since the sign is long gone. Maybe sugar processing or something like that. It's made of brick, and it's four stories tall with a bunch of pretty big windows, smokestacks on top, land around it for a ways, and then cornfields. So anyway, last fall, someone came and built a fence around it. Chain link with concertina wire on top, like you see on prison buildings. Seemed like that fence appeared overnight. I thought that was weird, but it was hopefully that someone was planning to fix it up. But winter went by, and nothing changed, at least nothing I could see. 
I couldn't figure it out and started to wonder. Who puts a big fence like that around a building no one's using? Then spring came and someone came and bricked up all the windows. I didn't think that much of it. After all, most of the windows were broken. I really didn't know why they didn't just tear it down, though instead, seems like it'd be a safety hazard. I guess it's in the middle of nowhere, sort of, but still. Mine is one of only a few houses around it. Probably used to be more houses around when the factory was operating. Soon after the windows were bricked up, cars started coming and going from the building, coming in through an automatic gate that was installed in the chain-link fence. Nondescript cars. Nothing you'd remember or notice. I still didn't think about it that much except that, around the same time that the work started there, my cell phone stopped working. Like calls would drop for no reason. Other times I couldn't call out at all. What's really weird is that if I drove just a few blocks away, my phone worked fine. It actually took a few weeks for me to put two and two together on this connection with my phone and the building. But once I did, I couldn't get I out of my mind. So I decided to get out an old shortwave radio my dad left me when he passed. It's a blocky metal thing that weighs about a hundred pounds. Kind of fun to play around with because you can hear stations really far away and sometimes even pick up other strange signals. I hadn't done it in a while, but I decided to fire it up. Usually just catch the same few stations, but this time I heard something I never had before. It was garbled, but loud. The signal was so strong that it had to be close by, which was super freaky. I listened for a while, but I couldn't make heads nor tails of it. It wasn't any language I recognized. Seemed like I'd catch a word here and there and then just junk again. The next day, my phone started doing something even weirder. I'd be on a call and then start to hear something else at the same time. In the background, like, you know, like when you get two radio signals at once. I called the phone company, but they said there was nothing wrong with my service. They didn't know any reason for either the calls not going through or the weird background noise. They hadn't heard of anything like that. I then went back and listened to the radio station again. I wanted to compare it to the noises on my phone, and it really sounded the same as the phone. Same deep voice speaking gibberish. I was starting to get freaked out. I decided to walk by the factory and see if anything was new or stood out to me. When I got there, I peered through the new fence and thought I could see something behind the building and decided to try to check it out. I walked off the road, went around the building, following that fence to the back. I was definitely scared that whoever was in there would see me, but I planned to just say I was looking for my lost dog or something. When I got around the corner, I saw way behind the factory a large metal structure. Something that looked like satellite dishes, you know, for TV, only bigger. I wasn't able to get a good look, though, because a guy who looked like a security guard standing closer to the building started walking toward me, fast. But he wasn't saying anything. I hightailed it out of there and headed back home, although I took the long way around. I didn't want him to know have any inking of the direction I lived in. Once back home, I decided I'd look up the place on Google Earth, see if I could find satellite images of the top of it. I typed in my address and moved down the street. Nothing. I checked again, thinking maybe I had got something mixed up. But I did properly have billings at the top of the screen, where it should be. But all I saw in the images was my house, and all the other places nearby, and cornfields. No factory. I googled factories and billings and got pictures of a few refineries and sugar beet factories, but not the one near my house. I couldn't find a picture of it anywhere. It was like it didn't exist. The next day I turned on my shortwave radio again, but the loud station with the garbled voice was gone. And coincidentally, or not, my cell phone started working fine again. A few days later, I drove by the factory as slowly as I could convince myself was safe and there weren't any cars there anymore. I then took a chance at being seen and circled toward the back of the building. I didn't see the huge metal dishes anymore. I didn't see the security guard this time either and I wondered if they moved the dishes because of me. Did they take out the whole operation just because of me over there looking and asking then phone company questions? There's no way I could have mattered that much. Anyway, the place looked pretty deserted. No cars, no people. 
It was as if I had imagined it all. Over the next week, they brought in a huge wrecking ball and tore the building down, hauled away every last brick. But they left up the fence. Big chain-link concertina wire fence around. Nothing. I'm now convinced that it was a secret government facility, and they were communicating with someone or something secret. Aliens? Another country? Russia? I don't know. It was January, the start of the spring semester, and some friends of mine were throwing this huge party to welcome everyone back. I was having a great time, honestly, for the majority of the night. Something that I noticed early on, when I had first arrived, was that there was garbage scattered all across the front yard. All the trash bags and cans have been toppled over and torn into. Obviously, I assumed this was because of some animal, but it was actually insane how much trash was scattered about. I mention this because not only was the yard of the frat house trashed, but so were the yards of nearly every other adjacent house on the block. It seemed like whatever was messing with the garbage was big and hungry. Coming from a rural area myself, we had a lot of times where we had an unwelcome stay from a family of raccoons or even the occasional bear. But it was never as bad as the way that block looked, so much so that everyone I was with that day commented on it too. And then, that was the last I thought of it. Until later. A few hours later, around midnight, I went out on the back porch for a smoke with my friends. That's when I noticed that the porch reeked like urine and something else I couldn't put my finger on. I assumed someone partied too hard and peed on the porch as a joke or something. I don't know, I couldn't think of any reason other than that. We're out there for a little while when all of the sudden we hear a yell coming from the opposite side of the yard, from the front of the house. It takes me a second to register what the hell is going on, but my friends run back inside to try and see what the fuss is about. So there I am, alone on the porch, with no idea about the impending weird stuff I'm about to witness. I hear a distant conversation yelling, but I'm not paying too much attention to it. I'm just sort of looking out into the yard. Then I see it run by. Coming from the front of the house is a creature that is big, massive even, and sprinting fast as hell. In fact, it was so quick that at first I didn't have a slight idea what it even looked like, only that it was speeding right through the yard, and it was big. Then it stops. It stops right near the edge of the yard, where the forest starts. It sits there for a moment, and even though it's dark, I manage to finally get a decent look at it. It was some kind of wolf, dog, man combination. Just the grossest thing you could imagine, sitting there on all fours and frothing at the mouth. I choked. It scared the crap out of me, and I just choked on my cigarette with the loudest, most obnoxious cough you've ever heard. This was, of course, a huge mistake. The wolf creature snaps its head towards me, and now we're making eye contact. I thought I was going to die, honestly. My nerves were shot. I just kept hoping that maybe someone would come back outside to check on me or something. I wanted to yell, but I knew that if I did, it would probably set this thing off somehow, so I kept quiet. As I'm looking at it, the freakiest thing happens. This wolf, it gets up and it stands on its hind legs, still staring. Now I really think I'm losing my mind because as big as I thought it was before, now the thing is standing at least seven feet in the air. Taller than me taller than any person I've ever been next to. It was so confusing to look at, really. But I wasn't so messed up that I didn't know what I was seeing. I could tell this wasn't normal. It had these crazy eyes, like glowing human eyes on a dog-like head. I told you already about how tall the thing was, but it wasn't just tall, it was also jacked. It's odd. Human torso was insanely muscular, which explains how it moved around so quickly, I suppose. I just didn't fully comprehend its anatomy. Even the human parts had fur, and even the animal parts looked vaguely human-shaped. We just sat there for a moment, looking at each other. I stood as still as I possibly could, and as boring as that might sound, it worked. Eventually, I won the staring match, and the monster thing just sort of became bored, I think. Lost interest in me. It turned around and ran straight into the woods without so much as a second glance. I will never forget that thing, its eyes, the novelty of it all.
I was sitting on the porch sipping on some coffee. I'm a big fan of coffee and just got this new type I've been wanting to try for a while. Anyways, I'm looking up at the sky and I notice this dark dot. It wasn't moving. It just looked like a black dot in the sky. I was racking my brain trying to figure out what it could be. Was it a helicopter? Was it a drone? Was it a satellite? I finished my cup of coffee, so I went and fixed myself another cup and didn't give the dot another thought. About an hour later, I got another cup and sat down on the porch again. I looked up in the sky and in the same location, the dot was still there. I went inside and grabbed my telescope and pointed it in the direction of the dot. Once I was able to focus on it, I noticed it was something metallic that was spinning and glowing blue. It was too far away to make out exactly what it was, but I was certain it was something out of the ordinary. Maybe the government was testing out some sort of new aircraft. I watched it for about 15 more minutes, and I noticed it started getting bigger, which meant it was getting closer. It kept getting closer and closer until I could make out the details of the aircraft. It was a large metallic disc that spun around, and the blue glow came from jagged lines that covered the bottom of the aircraft. They sort of looked like symbols, but not from any language I recognize. The disc kept getting closer and closer to me until I could start making out the details of the ship with the naked eye. The closer it got to me, the eerier it felt. This thing turned out to be massive, and I was seriously starting to question the motive of this thing flying around this area. I live in New Hampshire, and I'm about an hour from the nearest town. There's barely anybody that lives around me, and I'm not the biggest advocate of being monitored by the government. And if this is an alien UFO, I'd rather blast it out of the sky than be abducted by it. It got even closer to me, and it sounded pretty frightening. It sounded like a cross between a train and a refrigerator. The closer it got, the louder it got, until it was far too close for comfort. I went inside and grabbed my sniper rifle and aimed up at the giant spacecraft. At this point, the sound was so loud I couldn't hear myself think, and it started hurting my ears. It hovered directly over my property and started coming down to the ground. I fired a shot off as a warning, but it kept on coming closer. I fired another one right at the sucker, and it ricocheted off like it was nothing. I shot all the ammo I had in the gun, and it didn't deter this thing in the least. The sound was becoming more and more unbearable, and I ran into my house and locked the door. I grabbed my shotgun and peered out the window as this thing got closer and closer to the ground. All of the sudden, the spacecraft opened up and a bunch of black figures started falling to the ground. I panicked, ran upstairs, opened the hatch, and crawled up the ladder into the attic. I locked the attic hatch and sat there pointing my shotgun at it. My heart was pounding and I was preparing to go out with a fight. I heard the doors bust open, windows smashed in, and the sound of hurrying footsteps all over the house. I tried to breathe as quietly as I could, trying not to give away my position. Something pulled at the attic hatch aggressively, and I prepared to blast it to smithereens. Then it stopped trying, and I just listened to all the fast footsteps throughout the house. All those things were running vigorously around the house, and the whole time not one of them said a word. I was seriously disturbed. Finally, the footsteps just left into the distance, and I heard the ship's noise outside slowly fade to silence. I probably waited up there for another two hours, and after not hearing anything else, I decided to come out and check things out. I unlocked the hatch, opened it up, and aimed down. I didn't see anything, so I opened the ladder up and climbed down as silently as I could. When I got down... I saw my coffee cup, sniper rifle, telescope, and family picture placed directly underneath the hatch. It was like they were sending a message that they knew I was up there. I checked the entire house and didn't see any of them. Those things broke all my doors and windows, sent a disturbingly cryptic message, and left everything else completely untouched. What the hell just happened to me? I called the police and they came and told me that it was probably some kids playing a prank. When I told them what I saw, they just told me to be careful and left. I feel so violated and I want revenge for the trauma these things have caused me and financial restitution for all my broken property. It's going to cost me an arm and a leg to fix everything, and I'm living off disability on a very tight budget.
How can I ever sleep again, knowing that those things could just come again from the sky at any given moment? 